Hello and welcome to the Gaming 30 edition of the FPL School podcast. I am one of your hosts, Matthias, and uh, with me today I have uh, Kevin. But before I introduce Kevin and talk a bit to Kevin, I'm just going to address a little bit about why I haven't made videos this week. I usually do the weekend walkthrough on Mondays and uh, weekly walker draft on either Tuesdays or Wednesdays. But uh, I had a bit of an issue with the, in terms of the health of the family. So a family member had uh, an issue, had to go to the hospital, but it seems like everything's going to be all right now. So everything looks good. So I'm really thankful for that personally, and uh, I'm just happy to to move on and uh, with everything in order. So yeah, no, nothing to worry about there. Uh, everything's going to be fine, and I'm going to be back making videos. We have the podcast today, and tomorrow we'll have uh, I'll have a team selection video that I actually just recorded before this podcast, but I'm going to talk more about my own team in that. But in this podcast, I'm going to talk about Kevin's team. I'm going to talk about Kimo's team. Kimo is not here today. He's uh, back in Egypt during Ramadan. But Kevin is here. He is in Sweden. You have gone back uh, during Easter to be with your family as well. So, so yeah, how are you doing, Kevin? How has uh, Sweden been treating you since you've been back? Yeah, it's been a good, good change of pace. I think uh, sort of the it's, it's weird to say monotony of London, considering how big of a city it is and stuff like that. But I think it's always nice to get a change of pace every once in a while. So I think it's just a clever decision to come here, spend some time with friends and family, got a lot of fun plans coming up for the Easter break and uh, done a lot of fun things too, including seeing the Super Mario film, which was super nostalgic and fun and uh, more uh, things like that in the coming weeks. So yeah, just really nice to recharge the batteries, really nice to have working internet because we've had a lot of issues, which is why I haven't even been featuring in the podcast because uh, we haven't had stable internet at our place, at our new place in London. So it's fun to have working internet. It's fun to have IPTV so I can watch all the league matches from everything. And uh, yes, yeah, good to be back on the podcast too. Cool. It's great to have you back as well. And there's also another Scandinavian that's back, and that is uh, Erling Brat Holland. He is going to return for City. It seems like he's fit to play against Southampton. So a lot of people will, will be bringing him in, but... Yeah, we'll talk more about that later. We don't really have to t- talk that much about him in the intro. Let's just move quickly to your team. Your game of 2-9 score, you didn't have a bench boost because you used it in game week 6. And, uh, and yeah, looking at your bench, you might be regretting that decision, but I'll let you do the talking. What do you think about the game week in general and uh, and the bench and, and all that stuff? I mean, I figured that there were going to be players that get outscored from the bench. So if I had like an optimal, optimal lineup, you know... I, you know, Kane and Botman obviously would have played over Fernandez and Madison, but then today, how was I supposed to know that Fernandez was dropped to CDM and that Madison would blank like all hell? I mean, I knew I wasn't a fan of Leicester for the last couple of weeks, especially the Southampton game completely for me killed any vibes uh, for Leicester. It just seemed like they were just on a downwards uh, trajectory. So it hurts. It, I mean, obviously, the issue here is the fact that I used my bench boost so early on, but that's because how could I have suspected that everything would line up and become the most template thing ever with the wild yeah. cards and planning and stuff like that? It's normally way more hectic than things have been going, but this last couple of weeks, it's like, load up on this team and you'll be fine load up on that team you'll be fine load up on this and you'll be okay and then if you look at the scores like i still got 112 yeah. without a, a bench boost that just shows that everything went perfectly in terms of like if you had uh, newcastle players you're fine if you had this if you had a brighton midfielder you're fine all this type of things just worked out perfectly so of course in hindsight it sucks that i didn't have a bench boost but at the same time like everything kind of worked out anyways i still went yeah. up in rank which to me is crazy considering i expected everyone to use their bench boost so even getting a green arrow is is an achievement for me so i'm 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 happy it's it's yes i look at the scores and you know 10 points with kane and henry and 19 i don't want to do the math because that would piss me <laughs> off yeah <laughs> but it's a lot at of the same time lunch, but... but at the same time like I can't complain. Also, just to, to to further give you some extra credit there, or at least like explain why you were sort of unlucky with that. It's as you can see on the bench boost, you used it in game week six, and that was the game week before the whole 
the queen died and the game we got postponed and that's why we got so many extra fixtures and that's why we got sort of like a template thing like you were talking about that's why you, we have so many extra fixtures and have such a clear bench boost option in game week 29 so you could have never foreseen that in game week 6 when you did the bench boost and you got a decent return i think you had a 10 pointer from from trippier i think in in the game week 6 bench boost so it wasn't the worst bench boost either from 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 that point so my bench boost personally i talk about that in the team selection video that's going to be out tomorrow but it's sort of like I got 30 points, so like, yay, great bench boost. But if you look at all the transfers and everything I did to have a good bench, it sort of didn't really work out in the end because I ended up with 114 points this week personally, which is only two points more than you. So, so yeah, your team is really good anyway. But the one thing that I think you might regret because you couldn't have done anything with the bench boost, you already did that in game six, but the transfer ended up being a bad one. And uh, I kind of have to take a bit of a bl the blame there because I was pretty high on uh, Fernandez before the game week. I know you were kind of tempted with Salah, but Salah as well really didn't really play that much. He played like 90 minutes in total, I think, over the two matches and they yeah. looked terrible. So yeah, anyways, the transfer. Um, you did this, you were actually going to do no transfers, but then right before the deadline, you also got noticed or you also noticed that uh, Let's Talk FPL, Andy, had the info about Saka being benched and that's why you did Saka to Fernandez. But you were actually going to stick with Saka, but... What do you think about the whole transfer thing and, and the transfer right before the deadline and stuff? Could have worked out, to be honest. I mean, it, it was... Um, it's more surprising to me that Man United have been so bad. Like, I thought they would... Like, don't get me wrong. Going to St. James Park is never going to be an easy task. And that's why I have two or three Newcastle players anyways, because them at home is a different beast. But I was... Um, I was watching El Clasico and um, I was watching the Manchester United game at the same time and both were eyesores for completely different reasons. <laughs> FPL wise, the sure Rashford scored and everything like that, but they weren't that good. I was not very, very impressed. I was impressed with Rashford that the one chance he gets, he absolutely blasts it yeah. into the net. But Fernandez was playing at CDM and, you know, got praise for the awesome performance he did there and all this type of stuff, which isn't great for FPL reasons. And obviously I was hoping they'd get some terrible pen, but they didn't get that either, which yep. then Bruno, the differential would have been able to do something with. But United did not impress me at all. Yes, I got 24 points from Rashford, but still, I wasn't impressed. And um, yeah, it, it's I'm a bit frustrated that I don't have Saka now going for the next week. But yeah. cause Liverpool and all this type of stuff, I don't mind just waiting one week to bring him back in. So I can yeah. have Fernandez. He normally scores against Everton anyway. So yeah. And if Michael Keane is currently going to start more games, we're going to concede more pens. So, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like yeah, like he did against uh, Spurs. But yeah. but, yeah, I mean, the thing you could have done was just bench Saka for Kane, for example. It was all yeah, that. But course. it was also in the heat of the moment. It was, like, the final five minutes before the deadline. And uh, Fernandes looked like a really good option. So, because we were talking about uh, you doing that transfer before the news about Saka as well. Like, you were considering doing Saka to either Salah or Fernandes because... They looked like really good options, but Man United and Liverpool have just not been that good uh, lately. So yeah. I guess that's that's the issue with them. But anyways, a really good game week for you, I think, in, in general, considering you didn't have the bench boost. You got 112 points, so so you should be happy, uh, in my view. We yeah. should both be unhappy. We both have Alexander Isak, and uh, he got a blank against uh, Man United, even though he played really well. Cause he's been playing amazingly lately, Isak. But then Callum Wilson came on, and he scored, and then he got to play again against West Ham and scored twice. Isak finally got the goal. Fabianski gifted him a goal, so you're welcome. As a West Ham yeah. fan, I'll say that. But anyways, well taken goal from Isak as well. He kept his calm, uh, even though he got like a decent chance from like 30 yards or whatever it was and just slotted it easily into the goal. So Isak should be playing. I think they should play both of them, to be honest. If Callum Wilson is in good form, and Isak is definitely in good form, so just there's no reason you can't play both of them. But I don't know. What do you think about the whole Newcastle striker situation going forward? I think it's a bit excessive uh, to be so, I mean, it seems a bit harsh and I don't, any, you know, Murphy's family and all this stuff. I'm so sorry. If you end up somehow getting uh, a clip of this, I'm sorry, but I don't think Murphy warrants benching Isak, Isak essentially, yeah. because I think um, 
the funny thing that people forget about uh, St. Max is that he was a striker at Nice and played sort of then the second striker role and has played as a cam. I don't understand why you can't just play St. Max behind the two strikers, you know, mm. sort of fire and ice. You have yeah. a tall guy in Eastlick and then you have a fast, nimble guy in Wilson. I yeah. don't understand why you can't have that balance. Oh, you know, the wingers do stuff defensively. Do Murphy and St. Max actually contribute that much defensively? I think St. Max does a little bit, but yeah. I, I'm a bit miffed to why you can't um, facilitate something where you have a striker who's your record signing, who should be playing week in, week out, and then you have Callum Wilson, a proven Premier League striker who bags at least double-digit goals every season. So just make it work and whenever i have seen them on on the pitch together they look good so yeah personally i would try and facilitate a move where both play yeah i mean you can't really argue with the results they beat man united and destroyed west ham yeah. so i guess yeah, that's, sure. That's, uh, sure, sure. that's that's the thing but and murphy got an assist and played well and all yeah. this type of stuff but isak is, is just so good you got to find some way to play him so i'm going to keep him personally and i think yeah. you're going to as well because he's just 100%. so good he can be like a huge like it was uh, last game, like 13 points. You can, he can do that more in the future as well. But moving on to Kimo's team, this is pretty similar to yours, except that he has a weaker bench because he hasn't used any of his chips uh, so far. Mm-hmm. He did have his bench boost available, but seeing as he had Ward, he had Sinchenko against... Uh, it's, that's not the worst pick fixture, but Tarkovsky against Man United... Or no, what was it? Tarkovsky against Spurs. Not the greatest... Uh, bench to use a bench boost on and he also has the wild card for gaming 33 and can do the bench boost in gaming 34 with like a super team for gaming 34 as well so so it makes sense for him not to bench boost but other than that in terms of the starting team he has the exact same team as you except for like we said isak he doesn't have isak he has joao felix instead or what do you what, what do you make of felix as well at least like with his current performance because he's still looking really good but he's just not getting a fail points and now that Frank Lampard is in there. We're going to talk a bit more about the managers in the fixture ticker, but what do you think about Felix and what Kimo should do with Felix? I think I think the issue with Felix was the fact that he's always so close, but he just hasn't gone that mega haul that I know that he's more than capable of. And, uh, you know, I'll be talking more about it later, but I think he will start to haul under Frank Lampard. It sounds like a very mm-hmm. strange thing to say that he can't haul under Potter, but he can haul under Lampard, who's a beyond um, subpar manager, let's be real. Um, but, you know, it's 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 a bit frustrating, right? Because I understand that Kimo was one of the very first in a, much earlier than a lot of these other FPL content creators to say, you know, Watkins is someone to look out for and stuff like that. And it seems so, you know, um, in hindsight, it's really frustrating to be able to say like, oh, he should have just gone for Watkins. But at the same time, now that Watkins is on penalties and all this type of stuff too, I think that is an easy transfer for him to do, especially considering that there are some people who want to captain Watkins next week. But my issue with Watkins is, He's sort of similar to Kane where he gets, you know, the one goal yeah. per game. He never mega hauls. And yeah, the difference is explosive. But it, but the difference between him and Kane is Kane can haul and has hauled, you know. So yeah. uh, but I think sticking with Felix isn't the worst thing in the world because there's so much more to come from Chelsea and I think we have to remember the thing with Lampard is he had youngsters and took them to a Champions League spot. They've spent six hundred million on top of the other gajillions they've already spent, and he has an even bigger playground to mess around with. And I think that's the issue with Lampard. If he doesn't have the players that work for him, it's not going to work. No. Now that he has an abundance of players that work yeah. for him, in the sense of he's reunited with Mason Mount, so Mason Mount is now gonna you know get minutes again i don't care i like chelsea will try and minimize the amount of minutes that he has lampard is his father he's gonna definitely uh make sure that he plays i mean he's gonna promote mason mount into a sporting director it's the killian mbappe (laughs) thing but at chelsea so like i think mason mount is gonna get more minutes which is also beneficial for them because i think whilst i love enzo fernandez he's still a deep line playmaker and you need someone like 
Mason Mount to be creating the chances. I hope to God, like I know Chelsea fans are getting a bit frustrated off Loftus Cheek playing week in, week out. So um, I think sticking with Felix isn't the worst bet yeah. in the world. Yeah, I think Felix has such high potential as well, like you mentioned. So I think he's like a nice differential option to have, especially if you have him already. I probably wouldn't buy him now, but uh, but yeah, I think he's also a super wild card in terms of uh, Lampard coming in. You don't really know what's going to happen because you know with Chelsea under Lampard previously, they were really good in the first season and then they struggle afterwards. So it's a bit different. Like, you know, um, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, the former Man United manager, he struggled with Cardiff, but he did much better when he got like the interim role with Man United. So the same thing can happen with Lampard, even though he failed at Everton spectacularly, as you as you know, as an Everton fan. He might yeah. do much better with Man United and a better squad, or with Man United, with Chelsea and, uh, and a better squad now. So we'll see what happens with that. But anyways, decent game week for Kimo as well. Without a bench boost, he got 108 points. Really good for him. So uh, so yeah, he has all his chips left as well. It's going to be really interesting to see what he's going to do uh, coming up, but we'll get to that later. We also have the final manager to talk about, and that is the manager of the week from our mini league. And as you can see above me here, you can see the mini league code 6iyv7u you can join the mini league and if you are the highest scoring manager of uh, the game week you'll be featured on the podcast so we'll talk about your team and talk about what you should do in the future so this is simon humber i think he's like 500k just about in the world and he got a staggering 145 points with the bench boost you can see like the small little shitty bench boost uh, graphic there like it is on the fail site with just like a small thing around i really hate that design but whatever uh it's added in this uh, slide as well but he had uh not the best bench in terms of, he had less bench points than, than you did so i think that's why you're shaking your head but <laughs> what do you think of uh, what do you make of his team in general i just hate his team and love it at the same time <laughs> like there's so many things that i could say about his team that i'm just like why does he have Sanessi for for starters when all they do is concede goals? Um, I do like that he, he's gone with Trostard and Martinelli and all this sort of differential stuff, but uh, kudos to him uh, for taking out Almiron, finally, I guess, uh, for McAllister, because Almiron doesn't even get to play anymore. Um, yeah, he's injured. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, um, I like it. I think Fabian Char is a good pick because... Yeah. As I've tried to explain to so many people, Botman does nothing offensively. Like, I've I've watched football matches with people, and they're just like, you know, they have Botman in their team, and they're like, oh, you know, like when is Botman gonna come up for the header and for the corner? I'm like, he he's never. If you actually look at the corners, he's never there, like ever. He had that one chance yeah. six like six years ago, and that's it, you know. Um, so I think, Fabian Schaar, I think Fabian Schaar I think Fabian is the much better pick out of the two in terms of offensive uh, returns. Yeah. And Schaar was he was actually pretty unlucky with Schaar because he could have had way more points against Man United because he had really yeah. decent chances and had some good shots as well that just went right outside the post. So, so yeah, 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 yeah. Could have had way yeah, more he, for Schaar as well. But he's yeah, hundred percent got the rocket. So yeah. But yeah, he used his bench or he used his bench boost this week. But he used his uh, wild card last game week, so this is actually a pretty new team for him. So that's why I'm sort of questioning the Elmeron pick personally. But that sort of also explains the fact that he's used free hit already. Sort of explains why as Senesi, like I guess you could find a better player that has a fixture in game week uh, 32. But he has a fixture in game week 32, so that's part of the reason why he has him. So I'm sort of more questioning the the inclusion of Trossard because. He's not going to play that much going forward. I wouldn't trust him if I need all my players to play in Game 32. Trossard is not one of those players I'd like to keep, but we'll get to what he'll do in the future um, later on in the podcast. That's what we'll finish this podcast with. But this is just his team. Um, yeah, just mentioning more. Shar got 11 points, really good for him. Mitoma and McAllister had the two best Brighton midfielders, better than March, as I know, as a March owner. Uh, Watkins, 17 points as well. We've been talking about Watkins a lot in Dude. this podcast, but we, we we never owned him. None of us have. Not you, not me, not Kimo. You know, we talked about him a lot. So, so yeah, he, he was amazing once again. And, uh, and is a decent captain's option going forward as well, like we said. But anyways, good team, 145 points. Should be really happy. So we'll also get more into what you should do coming up lately or in the future because he has a lot of money in the bank, as we'll get to see. But... Before that, we're going to talk about a bit more about the fixture ticker and the fixtures going forward. 
And what should also be noted here is that this fixture ticker is ranked in terms of Game Week 30, 31, 33, and 34, and not including 32, because Game Week 32 is when most of us, not the manager of the week, uh, he's not going, to, not going to free it in 32, but for most of us, we're going to free it in 32. So I'm, I'm kind of disregarding that Game Week in terms of future fixtures, because we're going to do the free hit and have a selection of um, 15 players from that Game Week alone. But apart from that, um, the fixture ticker is ranked in terms of the other fixtures that you can see. And at the top, you got Man City, and uh, a lot of people are bringing Holland. We're going to talk more about that later. But in terms of this slide and the fixture ticker slide, I want to talk more about the teams that have gotten new managers because we have so many manager changes in the Premier League at the moment. So I'm just going to take you from the top to the bottom for, of the teams that have new managers. And the first team that has a new manager from this list is Crystal Palace, and they hired Roy Hodgson. And they looked amazing against Leicester in terms of uh, creating chances and stuff. Like, they were all over Leicester. And Everson had eight saves for Leicester because Palace were all over them, even with Saha going off early with an injury. So what do you think of Palace going forward? They have really good matches, as you can see. And even beyond Game Week 34, they have really good matches. They don't have the double Game Weeks, but they do have really good matches in general. So are there any Palace players, apart from Saha, if he's, if he's injured, or Saha himself, are there any Palace players you consider with Roy Hodgson in the, in the team now? Yeah, Berisha Eze. Always been a big fan of him. I've also liked Michael Elise, but um, I think Eze, for me, is always the one that I've always wanted to bring in, but never had because yeah. I'm too much of a coward. So uh, I would definitely keep an eye out for Eze. I think he, especially he's getting more and more confidence and i've always said that we are we're just waiting for that one season where he explodes and i think under roy hodson it can happen it's a bit weird all things considered because i never thought Vieira was a bad coach but yeah. you know so many draws and no wins it it was gonna it was borderline gonna happen and i know a lot of crystal palace fans and uh people that i play football with for that matter who say you know like they might as well have just kept the air if Hodgson is the one they brought in. But then after the game, they're like, eh, new manager yeah. bounce or, <laughs> yeah. eh, or is he actually really good at what he does? And blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's huge uh, from Roy to come back and, you know, it's a really tricky situation and to come out of retirement to be like, you know what, let's, uh, let's shake things up. And uh, yeah, I, I'm not a fan of their defense. I'm not a fan of great. I'm not a fan of, of their rotating circus strikers, but Saha, Eze, and Elise, or Elise, um, yeah, they're the ones that I'd say keep an eye out for. Yeah, fair enough. And I think also they're going to keep their place now with Hodgson. It seems like they're going to get that new manager balance, like you said, and then they'll look for a new manager in the summer, like a permanent manager. So I think they're in a decent position, but in terms of FPL, definitely not that interested personally either, unless Saha is, is fit and playing, maybe in a free hit gaming 32. That might be the game week you bring in uh, SA as well. It'll be interesting to see if you do that. But moving on to the next team without a manager currently, and that is uh, Leicester. They sacked Brendan Rodgers after a bunch of bad results this whole season. Um, and they didn't look particularly impressive with the new caretaker managers in charge, but currently the, the favorite to be the manager for Leicester is Rafa Benitez. I talked about that a bit more in the team selection video as well, but... What do you make of uh, Leicester and, and them going forward? Do you think they'll hire a new manager? Do you think they'll get Benitez? Do you think who do you think will take over there? And do you think it will affect Madison and potentially other picks for Leicester going forward? I think it all depends on which manager they end up getting. If I think if they get Benitez, Benitez to Everton just never should have happened. Full stop. Because I think it was just a blight for everyone involved. I don't think it showed what Everton were about. I don't think it showed what Benitez was about. Um, I am so biased, but I, even I can admit that it was just never a good fit. We know what Benitez can do. I thought he did a great job as uh, Chelsea's caretaker manager. He obviously did a really good job at Newcastle as well. You know, so if they get him in, I think it's it's not the worst. We've seen that they can play good football and stuff like that under Benitez, but it's just like they just look so bad lately. And yeah. I, I'm not 100% convinced that even a, a good manager can really fix the issues that's going on and stuff like that. I can't tell of whether it was the tactics or whether it was because we had so many inconsistent things happening in terms of 
scores. Like people had Castagna and that was going really well for them. People had Galecci during the sort of purple patch that he had. Madison was amazing during the first uh, half of the season and all yeah. this type of stuff. And Madison's looked terrible. This player's looked bad. So I'm not 100% sure that a manager can come and fix things, but it all depends who they end up getting. Yeah. I think there are a lot of good available managers, and if they get the right one, things could possibly change. But it's not looking good, Griff. And uh, I, 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 it's Madison's got to go. Like he's yeah. not. Like I don't mean in like a, he should leave Leicester. He's terrible, but more the Leicester are terrible. He's got to go. Yeah. Like he deserves Premier League football. And if the Spurs rumors are true. I think it's perfect. It it sounds like a weird thing to say considering Spurs is like where football careers go to die. I'm sorry, but it's true. Uh, Richie should never have left. Um, but he's exactly what they need. Christian Eriksen was so close to signing with them, yeah. and I think they would have been in a much better position if he had Definitely. just picked it. They need, they need a cam. They can't just expect Kulisevsky to do everything creatively. So Madison going there would be perfect. And... Um, yeah, it's a shame. I, I've Lester's whole story has been a fairy tale. To be able to say that, it's crazy to me to say that they've been able to win the FA Cup and the Premier League in the last decade. That's insane, considering the fact that they've been relegation favorites all the time, and now from a good foundation, it's just been crumbling into pieces. So, yeah, it's a shame. But I like. You look at their fixtures and stuff like that. Bournemouth at home. Like, I'm not going to get rid of Madison for that game. Yeah. But I want to because I'm not a fan of how they've been playing. Yeah. I think he is like a decent hold for Game Week 30 with uh, the Bournemouth yeah. match. Easy match. And then if they get a new manager, it might look entirely different in terms of uh, Madison's output. And we talked about Benitez. And I think one of the things with Benitez in the past, he's shown that the players playing right behind or right next to the striker are usually really good under Benitez. Gerard had like some of his best seasons under Rafa at Liverpool. Luis Garcia had a similar role for Liverpool and played really well uh, during Benitez's reign. Also, Paris was like one of the highest scorers for Newcastle. He plays in sort of similar style as as Madison. You have Calajon at uh, Napoli when uh, Benitez was there. He got quite a few points. Um, so yeah, I think that type of player, like Madison is, benefits a lot from playing in a Benitez system. So I'd be interested to see that fit myself. But but yeah, I'm going to keep a close eye on him during the Bournemouth match because it didn't look good against uh, Crystal Palace. But they could they could improve, especially with a new manager. So I think that's interesting. We talked a little, little bit about Spurs, and they also have a new manager. Ryan Mason is uh, the interim manager until the end of the season. You got a close look at what he can do against uh, Everton. You're an Everton fan, so you got to watch that uh, watch that match. So, what do you make of uh, Spurs and their assets uh, going forward as well? Is, is there any change with Mason, or is it more of the same? Like, what what do you make of the Spurs assets? I felt that they played a lot more direct football. Like, I think, uh, which is really weird to say, considering Conte. comparing Conte football to Ryan sorry, Mason. St- Stellini is the one who take, took over. The, yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. yeah in that regards but you know um it looked until we see ryan mason again like it looks fine like i i don't personally feel like i need to get rid of kane and stuff like that uh or any or any regards of that but it's just more that everton should have won that game and that says a lot considering where everton are in the table but it's also a bit unfair to say because we beat in a lot of teams that we shouldn't be beating at home. So that you could, you know, blame that on Everton just being good at home. Um, but I was more impressed that the wingers were playing so well under um, this. Um, so for me, it's just more just the question of can they keep this up and can more players get involved in terms of the FPL aspects of things? Or is it just going to be Kane and always Kane right and Kane was not involved in that game at all so maybe yeah. under Mason it might look a bit better uh, of course he got a BS penalty and all this type of stuff because Michael Keane can't defend for 
um, uh, as we say in Swedish, which is for 5p. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah, it's 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 a weird one. It's like this is the most spurred thing that could ever happen. It, it's very strange. Yeah. The quality of players are there. I don't know what's going on with Son. I I think it's very um, noble of him to admit that he hasn't been the best this season, and he feels it's crazy for him to say that he feels uh, responsible for Conte getting sacked and all mm. this type of stuff. But I think now the Kosevsky's injury free and all this type of stuff, things will look better. I'm sure. It's just the question of who they end up getting in the summer. I think that's the most important thing. If yep. it's a Poch reunion, amazing. I think that will go really really well but let's see yeah. yeah i think spurs they just look more of the same really and uh i've been keeping an eye on pedro poro i think he's a decent option he didn't seem yeah. as offensive against everton as he did in the southampton match but i think he's still someone to take uh, take a look at but as you can see they have decent fixtures up until free hits the game week 32 but after that they have difficult fixtures and they don't have a double in 34 so i think that's sort of the point where you can sell kane and bring in someone else like a liverpool striker or or hold on if you if you wait until game 33 mm -hmm. uh but yeah for now i think you should just keep your spurs spurs assets really and then the final team we got to talk about in terms of managers that is uh, chelsea we already talked a bit about them already so don't really have to touch more on that but i'm just going to ask you if you could pick one player you think will benefit from frank lampard being the new manager now rather than potter who would you pick and why I'm going to break the rule that you just stated and pick two players. Okay. Juan Felix, I think, will benefit massively if he okay. if he's the sort of chosen boy in terms of um, the one who will play the cam or second striker, simply because that is exactly what Frank Lampard likes, a nimble guy who can shoot, who can pass, who is super creative. The exception to the rule is all depending on whether Chelsea force Lampard to bench Mason Mount, but obviously I think Mason Mount would be a yeah. huge uh, addition to this team, and um, I uh, believe that that's the move that you got to do, that Mason Mount can really explode. I mean, his price has obviously gone down in FPL and etc., but I think Mason Mount could explode. I mean, I already touched upon it. He's yeah. the Kylian Mbappe of Chelsea. He's going to become sporting director. He's going to have a lot more influence in the Chelsea attack and Frank Lampard has favorites so I think Mason Mount is someone to keep an eye out for. Yeah, I think that 8-0 win against Norwich, that was under Lampard was it or was that under someone else? Was that, I or, was that, or was that Tuchel? I can't remember. There's, they have so many different managers. At yes. Points, but <laughs> But yeah, I think uh, I think also, like you said, Mountain and Felix are two really good shouts, and I think also the the wing backs can still continue to provide because Lampard Absolutely. has utilized them earlier as well, and they've been really good fancy op options under Lampard before at Chelsea. So I think those guys are really good as well. So yeah, that's that's it for the manager talk. We talked a lot about the different managers and the fixture ticker. So let's move on to our plans and uh, or not not plans before we do that we're going to do the weekly wildcard draft i didn't do a video like i said i haven't been able to do a video this week on the weekly wildcard draft but this is what i've come up with in terms of uh, which 15 players i'd pick if i had the wildcard right now mm -hmm. um so yeah as you can see there's a lot of changes from uh, the weekly wildcard draft from last week and that's because man united really disappointed me madison and lester like we said really disappointed me I've switched from McAllister to Mitoma in terms of the Brighton mm -hmm. midfielder that I want to have because I think Mitoma has just been more consistent and he's he just keeps getting points even though he doesn't get that much in terms of XG. And then Havertz, Chelsea, unsure future. That's why he's dropped. And Saka was, was out and sort of... He was sort of... I don't know. He, he's still a good option, but not so sure about Arsenal going forward. And then Kepa as well, losing his place. And that's the other interesting part about Lampard coming in. He favored Mendy back in the day. So do you think... Kepa will still play because he's been better lately or do you think Mendy will come back now because they're sort of similar price but a lot of people have Aris Balaga so what do you think I think Kepa will definitely continue playing uh you know it says a lot that even Spain let him be the number one and stuff like that there's a big big um sort of swing into Kepa's favor he's been playing decent I wouldn't say he's done anything to sort of warrant definitely being the number one right yeah because i mean 
I, I see that, but at the same time, he's he's had good games and stuff and like solid. that too. Yeah, and I think until he makes a blaring mistake or anything like that, Keppa will continue to be their number one. So fair enough. But in terms of uh, the the rest of the team, I think you're muted now. But I think for the rest of the um, rest of the squad, what do you think about the squad? Are there any players you you are unsure about? What do you think about stuff like Grealish, for example? He's sort of like an out there pick. Andreas really cheap. He's more an enabler. Uh, Watkins finally makes his uh, his debut in this team as the fourth pick, even because he's just been so good lately. But are there any sure. impressions you have of the team in general, uh, apart from from Kepa as well? Um, I mean, just looking at just looking at the team, just generally speaking, I hate the Iverson pick, but you know that's just because he's uh, he's he's a cheap enabler, and also um, I just don't like Leicester currently in terms of how they've been playing, etc. But other than that, I think I mean I mentioned Grealish uh, not too long ago as yeah. a differential pick, so I'm more than happy to to see him there. Um, I think Andreas has been going a little bit under the radar and now that Mitrovic is gone for eight games, definitely on penalties, definitely mm. on uh, free kicks and everything like that. So, um, yeah, I, I think this was a good um, good call. Um, Matoma has been fantastic. I mean, obviously, I might have said McAllister, but McAllister seems to be that he's now only dependent on penalties because he keeps playing a bit more defensively. Uh, Rashford's Rashford, Holland, Holland, Isak's been great. It's just a question of maybe if are we missing out on Kane but nah, I think all things considered I don't hate the Salah pick either because Salah has been one of the better things that happened with uh, Liverpool even though they've been so up and down in terms of stuff he still scores and he still showed that he's got what it takes um, yeah I'm, I'm I'm this is one of the few times i don't have any big issues with the team so uh yeah well done fair enough so there's no are there any players you you think about personally that is not in the squad are there any standouts that you feel like are missing you mentioned I mean, Kane, I, I, but it's, it's I, sort of like a Kane or solid choice uh, in terms of the squad so any other players cheaper players than Kane, you're missing i mean obviously the one that's the blaring omission especially after a 38 point haul if you had him as captain was uh callum wilson right i mean yeah. I prefer Isak. I know that he's better than Wilson and all this type of stuff. Um, but you can't sort of ignore his form as of late. Yeah. Fair enough. That's it for the weekly wildcard drafts. This doesn't mean that you should wildcard. Uh, but this is just the best suggestion that I have if you if you do want to wildcard. And that's going to be a weekly feature on this podcast. It has been, or this uh, YouTube channel, I should say. It has yeah. been for the f- past few weeks. And I'm going to keep that tradition going all the way until the end of the season and at the start of next season as well i'm going to keep doing that and showing you the best 15 players currently in terms of uh, having a squad moving on Absolutely. we have the game week 30 plans and this is your team yeah. you have a pretty straightforward plans like most of uh, fpl managers currently you're looking at doing tony to holland you have a lot of money in the bank so you could even do isaac to holland if if you want to but it seems like you are pretty set on tony um, there's also like a benching thing you have to do here. I have Isak as the bench because it's basically what I did for my team, but I know you want to play Isak um, personally. So who are you looking to bench out of this, uh, this squad? And uh, are there any other transfers or moves you're potentially considering doing instead? For example, Watkins. Is he someone you could imagine having as well? Yeah, uh, I mean... Um... Can you hear that? Because we're going to have to... Edit I, I, it can't, out I can't hear anything. Okay, good. All right. Um, so... Uh, uh, oh, uh, so um, personally for me, the way that I would do this is maybe benching McAllister over Matoma and putting Isak in simply because McAllister has sort of been penalty reliant on getting goals and stuff like that, whilst Matoma has just been getting goals and assists just just out of pure pace and just well good play so that would sort of be the one that i do but then this is a question of do i do a weak rental of walk-ins instead of isak or something like that just to be like yep or but i don't know there's just so many good options for next week um so yeah it's just this tough precarious position to be because i don't know 
if Newcastle's away form is so good to beat Brentford, who are decent at home. And if that's the case, then I might stick with Tony because yes, Holland is thousand percent better uh, than all these guys, and Southampton are crap and all this type of things. But for me, the issue now is could Holland get benched because it's the Champions League in the week, right? Yeah, they play Bayern Munich in the following midweek, so you never know with Holland. But I think they also want to get Holland some playing time before the Bayern Munich match. So you should obviously pay attention to the injury news with Holland. But I, th- I feel like he's going to start. I feel that's just the way they've been playing this whole season. They've had interesting Champions League matches early in the season as well, and Holland has still been playing every time. So only thing is, Holland hasn't really had the injury bug this season, and he has previously in the Dortmund during the Dortmund days and. Ho- Guardiola also said that he might like match him and not play him too much before the mm-hmm. season. That hasn't been an issue so far, but it could be. So I think it's sort of like an interesting thing. So I feel like you could wait until game week 33 to get Holland and you can just go with Watkins straight away. I feel like that's a decent option for you and anyone else really. If you don't have Watkins already, most people have him if you're a content creator or, or content consumer of FPL. But I think that's a decent move for you as well. So I think you should just keep keep uh, notice of what Guardiola says before the match and uh, see if Holland seems likely to start. I don't think we'll get early team news on that, but I think, yeah, you could de- definitely go with Watkins as well. And uh, if Holland is, for some reason, if he gets a setback or something, Alvarez is also a great option as well if if you want to have a City striker. Uh, but yeah, other than that, I think I think it's a decent transfer to only to Holland, but I'm not 100% sure if, if you can get Watkins instead, potentially do that. But I'm considering the same things myself, but... Just the final thing I want to ask you about your team as well is uh, captaincy. I assume if you bring in Holland, you're going to captain them, or are you looking at potentially Rashford or or someone like that? The tough one, right? Because I am also looking at Kane, even though they're playing Brighton. Kane at home is always scary. Um, Rashford is the man in form and they're playing at home and they're good at home and we're terrible away so it does seem like even if I did bring in Holland, I think I'll stick with Rashford and continue keeping Kane as vice but it, it all becomes a little bit of who says what <laughs> the interviews a little bit and also just thinking about uh, maybe looking at historical fixtures and stuff I have a feeling that Rashford is also pretty good against us as well because Fernandez definitely is. Yeah. Uh, but I think Rashford is actually pretty good against us as well. And yeah, so I think um, Rashford is probably who I'm going to go with. Okay. I, I might be a little bit cheeky and uh, swap Fernandez for Salah because uh, I like yeah. having a little bit of skin in the game, especially in a game like Liverpool Arsenal. Mm-hmm. I have a feeling that those guys are even though it says that Salah wasn't in training I feel like that's more a day off than him actually being injured yeah I think so so um so yeah so for me it's just a question of um whether Holland is actually really fit because I feel like Southampton away is the sort of game that they expect they're going to win and especially that Julian Alvarez has been playing really well that you might as well just give Holland that extra thing groin injuries aren't stuff that you, yeah. you're meant to rush as uh we've seen with the uh, reese james and all these sort of players that if you rush the groin injury players um you just aggravate it again that's the thing with groin injuries right non-contact uh can also you know so <laughs> so for me it just like you said it all comes down to what's be- being said in the interviews yeah yeah, same here. I think it's not essential to bring in Holland now because I think you can no. wait. The Game Week 31 fixture against Leicester is the more pressing issue. That's when you want to have him. But that's also in between yeah. the two Bayern games. So don't really know if he's going to start that one either. But currently, I feel like he's going to get probably 60 minutes, potentially 30 minutes against Southampton, I feel like. And I don't think he's going to play the full 90 because Alvarez is so good as well. So so yeah, that's, that's something you got to take into account. But... But yeah, that's your team. As also we noted, I always have one mistake uh, for you guys to look for in the lineup. I don't know. Can you spot the mistake? Uh, in, uh... Of course, it's we're not we're not playing Brighton. So. Yeah, Estepinian is Everton is not correct. That's that used to be Shaw. I switched them out with uh, Estepinian for the graphic, and I forgot to switch the fixture as you can see with Nathaniel right. McAllister, the base burst away. So, anyways, that's that's the weekly uh, small error that you can you can find in the in the graphics, but. 
Moving on to Kimo, and uh, there are two different uh, routes that I have set up for him. One of them is uh, his own uh, suggestion. I didn't really, was, I struggled a bit to get a hold of Kimo because he's in, he's in Egypt, but he finally told me that he's most likely going to do Kane to Holland because he doesn't have enough money to do Tony to Holland. But I feel like since he has the wild card coming up in, um, or he's going to do the wild card, he's going to do free hit in 32 and wild card in 33. I feel like he can sort of just do like a short punt on Grealish rather than Fernandez, and then for a minus four, bring in Holland for Tony and keep Kane. So do you think my suggestion is the best, or do you think Kimo's own potential move is the best? I like I like your suggestion more okay. uh, because I think Kane. I've always said Kane's sort of a season keeper, so I don't hate keeping him for a game or two more. Um, and I also think, like I've mentioned earlier in the podcast, like Grealish is a really good differential. The difference between him and Foden is Foden is way more explosive, but Grealish actually enjoys assists. So um, I think in terms of the link-up play between Grealish and Holland, it's just fantastic at this point. So, yeah, and I think... Um, you know, uh, he's slowly showing why he's worth 100 mil because he is doing a lot of these differential um, sort of moments, especially like uh, he did with the, the assist in the Liverpool game. And he's just continuously just building on that and quietly having a pretty good season, just generally speaking. I mean, this is going from the guy who everyone's like, oh, they should get rid of him and all this type of stuff to actually he's establishing himself at left wing. Yep. It's looking pretty good. The final yeah. option he could do as well is just do Tony or Shaw Felix to Watkins, like we like we mentioned. Yeah, of course. Because yeah. he, he can wildcard Watkins out of the team in game 33. He can do the free hit in 32. So he only has Watkins for 30 and 31, which are decent fixtures for him. So that's another decent option for Kimo, but he's going to have to decide for himself. Moving on, we have uh, the manager of the week, and that is Simon Humber. And like I said, he doesn't have the free hit in game 32. So I think he should prioritize transferring out players that don't play in uh, game week 32 and that is Chelsea and that is well, Arsenal do play but Trossard doesn't look likely to play so I feel like either Howard to Kane or Trossard to Salah or potentially both fixed transfers at the same time might be the better option for for this guy and uh, and yeah if he sells uh, Trossard as well he can also make room for Jesus who is going to be an interesting option now going forward so so yeah um, any any comments on uh, on this guy's team yeah, I think um, yeah, the Trossard thing it just rubs me the wrong way that he doesn't have Saka or um, he could also have Trossard to Saka to be fair. Yeah, um, it, yeah, I think the pre- more pressing thing is for me personally is probably getting rid of Trossard. Okay. So, but I don't know if if Salah is the one that he should be getting in or whether it should be, like you said, or what I suggested, which was Saka. So uh, for me, I think both moves would work. I think even maybe taking a minus four to sort of fix things wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Um, But yeah, uh, I think generally speaking with the Tony's good option, Watkins as captain would be great. Havertz away against Wolves who are so inconsistent isn't the worst thing in the world playing both Matoma and McAllister is a conundrum that all um, people who have both it's, will have it's a bad problem to have to be honest because I think they're still really good I think Brighton are going, yeah, to, of going to smash Spurs personally but, but yeah Fair. Uh, Rashford of course uh, if he wants to be you know, a reliable, um, not a reliable captain, but more consistent captain. He could just go with Rashford rather than Watkins because Rashford could haul against us, especially when they're playing at home. Yeah. But uh, I think, generally speaking, this is as optimal of a team that you can get. It's just a question of whether, um, like, yeah, you don't want Sanessi away from uh, away from home. You don't want Gabriel against Liverpool at Anfield. Like, I don't see a scenario where. Arsenal keep the clean sheet. Famous last words, I know. But yeah, um, yeah, I think this is as optimal as it gets. It's just a question of whether he finally gets in Kane or if he finally gets in X for Trossard. Yeah, fair enough. And that is the end of the podcast. And uh, yeah, just going to leave you with the 
the usual stuff. Hope you can like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. That would be much appreciated. Follow us on Instagram or Twitter. And uh, also, like I said uh, previously in the, in the episode as well, join our mini league so you can be f- featured as the manager of the week as well, like uh, Simon did this week. And mm-hmm. you can join the league code 6 iyv 7 u in uh, FPL. And as always, I'm going to leave the last word to Kevin before we send send everyone off and uh, say goodbye. What do you have to say, Kevin? Appointing Frank Lampard was a weird decision. Fair enough. Goodbye. <laughs>